great architecture, you know, really rises above the everyday, the some kind of the humdrum reality of our built environment and engages us, can inspire us in some ways. And as a user, you know, enrich our day-to-day lives, both in a very prosaic way, but also in an honorific way, no matter how modest or straight program may be, whether it's going to school, going to the doctor, going to purchase groceries, all of that is an opportunity for great architecture to happen. And that is what I think is worthy to pursue. It has the possibility to strengthen our institutions and transform our places in the most qualitative ways. So we're here at one of uh, my favorite barns. I really love these structures. They are structures of a singular purpose, but in many ways are very flexible. The barn for me is a singular figure that you find in the landscape. And this is a landscape where there's more space than form. Uh, and so the power and the simplicity of the form is felt in its relationship to the horizon and how it meets the ground and how it meets the sky. And for us, this is a, a great place to begin in thinking about the vernacular architecture of our place. Brian McKay Lyons said that, you know, the vernacular is what you do when you can't afford to get it wrong. So the directness and simplicity here are really evident in the way in which the barn is built. So as you can see, the, the stone base, that stone came from the field. And then the uh, timber comes from the forest itself, the oak, typically. In this case, this is a, a gable barn. So, you know, it is very simple, like so. Just a simple gable. But there are other types of barns here in the Ozarks where you get what we call the gambrel, round top barn here, a little barrel vault. What we like to do in an effort to connect with our place, we'll often take a, a fragment of this barn and kind of cut it, represent it in a way. So we might take, say, this part right here, how we can make a familiar form come to life in a more contemporary way. So I could take this piece here and pull it over to here. Pull that down and I might just totally reprogram it and drop in some new windows and such and I might totally make a, a very interesting structure for a new program. Who knows what this could be a house, it, it could be a, you know, it could be part of a medical clinic or whatever. Who knows, right? But the point being is it's now familiar but in a stranger way and it kind of connects to a larger discourse universal discussion about architecture so it's both local and global which for us equal local and so what we're always trying to do is to find that productive tension between where we already are in this case or here in the Ozarks and to that larger more universal discussion about architecture in, in general. And I think this is a great place to start where we get a lot of our inspiration, not just in form, but also in the way materials are used here, which I think is quite beautiful because you have to naturally ventilate. So these boards are laid out with, uh, you know, joints between them to help the air kind of blow through. Uh, they make their own hardware, which I think is quite inventive. Uh, uh, windows and doors, as you notice, uh, they don't change the whole material or the language of those doors. They actually bright blend in with the siding. And we love that. So is it a door? Is it a window? Or is it really just an operable wall? So th those are the kinds of things that we can learn just from studying the vernacular typologies 
of our place. So we're here in Gentry, Arkansas. This is literally our first public building. We were asked by the uh, library board uh, if we could take an old mercantile building, a hundred year old hardware store, and uh, turn it into a public library in a community room. We came up with a series of details, what we call soap bubble details, where we, instead of re-infilling the windows, such, we actually built glass vitrines on the outside and left the building like an old shell, like an old state of a ruin, and really just gave the past a future and a new identity. It's quite lovely. And actually, this structure, this horizontal shelf here, it's where they can place books and new journals, but that's also the lateral support for these big steel fins, and these are all load-bearing fins, so they're all carrying weight. Let's take a look on the inside. Hey, Linda, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Marlon. How are you doing? How's your summer going? It's going great. We've got lots of programming happening and cool. just lots of folks, so yeah, it's a good summer. The, the original uh, dream of the folks with the library board uh, was for this to really become a new city center. And rather than building it out on the interstate or the highway, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. let it be a, a seed project for the uh, downtown, for the Main Street. When we first started this project in 2000, there were 300 library card holders. 08, the last time I checked, there were over 2,300 library card holders in a town of 2,500. It's gone up. We're over, over 3,000. And, and I just saw the population mm -hmm. Uh, signed to come when I came up. It, we're at, you're at about 3,600 now. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, the town has grown, and so mm -hmm. has the uh, membership at the libraries. So, and you'll see, it's the it's whole project about providing the past for the future, but you know, having the old and new read uh, together. So the old is read in a different way, and the the new is uh, understood via the old. And photo from the original hardware store, and you can see these big round columns here, the old pressed tin ceiling, and these were really uh, failing foundations were. So we remade all of those in these very contemporary, uh, I call them these uh, crosshair uh, columns, uh, and then we uh, wrapped the columns with uh, books, it's all local cherry, and then we wrapped them in glass and then we put light in the bottom of it and it bounces up off the ceiling so we don't have to puncture the ceiling with lights. We can just use that beautiful decorative pressed tin ceiling in its natural state. One of my favorite spaces is this atrium we made. We kind of carved, they let, let us make one carve, had to add an elevator here, because they didn't have that stairway, grand stairway up to the second floor. And then there was an old skylight uh, hole right here. And rather than just close it up, we decided we'd just build a, a new skylight, but a different one, a vertical skylight. So this, this hole here, this existing hole, there's the top of it, and then we brought the glass down on three sides. So that, that part is solid. The new kind of inserting itself in the old and together becoming something completely different, uh, something that really made for the 21st century. And we put in this nice stairway. Again, replaced all the old heart pine with new heart pine, but kept all the original. So about 90% of this is the original heart pine hardwood floor. There's that nice connection between the first floor and the second floor. Really lovely skylight. I think it's one of the best skylights we've ever done. I love the old history room. It's all kind of activities that go here. I love this one of my favorite details where you just put the glass out here and you got your brick and just like it was in its old state, old ruined state. So really quite nice. Hey, Jim Marlon? Ferguson, how you doing? Good to see you, Marlon. All right, man, good to see you. Jim was here at the beginning. He was the head of the library board when we first started this out. So we, we did a seven year journey together. You were willing to come over. <laughs> and uh, Not knowing any better. Not knowing any better. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you, you viewed this building, which was, it was not in the best condition, but it was something that had a history that this ch town really cherished. And you took that vision, your vision, you put it together and you, 
you presented a model to our community that they just fell in love with it. But that, that sold it and our community got behind it and we just, we have this product today that everyone is proud of. So we're here in Springdale, Arkansas at St. Nicholas Antiochian Orthodox Christian Church, project that certainly is a place-based uh, approach to how one might make a church out of what was it's a, uh, a metal garage building. It's really an incredible transformation, uh, as you'll see, both in terms of form and, and space. Hey, Father John, how are you doing? Come in. Good to see you. Wow, I always love coming here. It's so, so beautiful. Well, wow, quite a journey together to make this happen. I, you know, like I say, this, it's hard to imagine that this just is to be a, a metal garage shed that we just added 10 feet here to create a, a narthex and an office for you upstairs. And then uh, a wonderful tower that we'll see and uh, it's and just really set up the whole transition to the sanctuary. And then, of course, your fellowship hall that we'll see here in a moment, too. Marla and I really like the way you made the ceiling come down like this. Ah, yes. Because when you come in, you, a person realizes that they have to be squeezed into a new birth. Ah. And the symbolism is beautiful. It, to enter into the kingdom of heaven, a person needs to experience getting out of the box and, right. and being squeezed, and, and this symbolizes that. Yeah, yeah, no, that, there was thought about that, about how we arrive at a human scale. Tower bathed in the blood of Christ. You bet, yeah. that Sangre de Cristo is so important to us, and originally we had intended the red light to shine through from our red window. Right. In the morning, the sun would come through and the red glass turned out to be so red that it wouldn't shine through. And so yeah. the, no problem, we just painted the whole tower red. Yes. And then our hope was when we leave church, the sun was shining down through the crystal clear glass and you left clean as the driven snow in New York. <laughs> All of the sections of the spaces to be based on ancient Greek proportioning and the golden mean right. uh, and all of that. So that, that even though this is a very modest, prosaic metal shed, in a sense it's been repurposed uh, uh, with new portion, proportions, uh, which mm -hmm. proportions don't cost anything. <laughs> you know, <laughs> scale and proportion are relatively free. And it, it worked out really, really well. It's very important for the Orthodox Christians to have uh, a beautiful facility to worship in. And uh, the old Russian proverb was that uh, beauty will save the world. And so there's something about special beauty that draws a man to God. Yeah. And so if it's pretty, it just, it's like love, we like it. And we yeah. can't really define it same way with beauty, but we know when it's beautiful. Yeah. And so this has been beautiful enough. It has helped people pray and get closer to God. We and tried to pretty, listen to you very carefully oh, because of course. That's, that's what we try to do is listen carefully and then act boldly. So that's what we try to do. And, and really simple things like cutting a hole in the old building to get some morning light in because we knew services uh, often happen Sunday morning and mm -hmm. you being backlit by you know, the heavenly light from the east mm -hmm. I think was really important and seems to work and then you know as the sun begins to set over in the west, the light streams through the blue glass and really lights all of the saints here. Yeah. And it was a good idea to make a dome here because we, we like the natural yeah. voice. And this really carries the choir, it carries the congregational singing, and yes. I don't have to shout. But there were some other things that you asked for too, which was, you know, to be able in certain times of the year to be able to allow for the the sanctuary to expand. We can just do this. Ah, oh, that's cool. Yeah, here we go. This opens up and you can put chairs and so forth here, but this opens right into the fellowship hall. You can even see the original structure of the old metal building up here where the classroom uh, loft is. All right, so we're kind of moving through the narthex right now and kind of head over to the fellowship hall. Uh, where everybody cooks and socializes and 
has fellowship after service. Hey, Jeremy. Hey, Marlon. Good to see you. Good to see you, man. This is Jeremy Lowry. Jeremy and his father, uh, they, they built this church. And uh, it's uh, uh, a kind of a heroic thing that they did. I think in the beginning you were hesitant to do a remodel, but it seems yeah. to have really turned into a rebirth of the same structure. Yeah, yeah you were right. We were, our hearts kind of sank a little bit when we were first told we had to keep the existing building. But it, it kind of all... I think there's a picture of that in yeah, here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, oh, yeah, here it is. Yeah, yeah, this is... Well, first of all, it's great. To, it was such an agricultural setting here. But this was the old... Uh, the old shed right there that was, like I say, is still here. When we just added onto the front of it and then reproportioned the whole thing, both outside and inside. So what I really love about this project is that we were able to do this whole transformation of this building for $100 a square foot. Uh, very little. In fact, when it won the 2013 uh, AIA National Honor Award, it is the least expensive building to ever win an AIA National Honor Award. And so what that has done is really kind of underscored what we've been doing all along out here for the last nearly 30 years, which is trying to demonstrate that architecture can happen anywhere, at any scale, at any budget, and for anyone. And I think another aspect of this is that we presented this small building to the World Architecture Festival in Barcelona, Spain back in 2011 in the civic and community category. And to our great surprise, this modest building was selected as the world's best civic and community building for 2011. So it really demonstrates that there is truly great within the small and that every project, no matter how modest, deserves to be architecture in the highest sense of the word. So all of this landscape used to be uh, agricultural farms, and now it's become more suburban. And that's defined by these sort of banal office buildings and this, uh, you know, what do you call strip malls and uh, things of that nature. And so we really wanted to provide something uh, a little different, a little more uh, alternative to that, that really recognizes people driving by in a, in a car, but also how people might drive through it, how people might walk up to it, uh, this uh, pediatric clinic uh, is really a, an alternative suburban model for building. One material, one detail, one form, two colors, and that's all we used here. Dr. Harvey, how you doing? I'm good. How are you, Marlon? I'm good doing to great. See you again. great to see. It's always a joy to come here because it's, you know, you it has this sort of iconic, you know, presence in the middle of uh, this kind of suburban condition, but then it's even more fun just coming inside and seeing what we were able to achieve together. Yeah, we get a lot of compliments. I get people that are in design and mm -hmm. marketing and they tend to be really impressed. And so I'll sometimes in the middle of you know visits give mm -hmm. a little bit of a spiel on what we worked on and yeah. what we wanted to have happen it certainly captures people's uh, attention yeah the light has been probably the uh yeah the, the biggest light. impact so yeah. places like this yeah. where it has such a cooling effect on mm -hmm. the building oh, overall hi hi i think this is so cool too yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> i've taken pictures just so the the light there that one's always captures people's attention i really mm -hmm. love this space because you know, when you come into a typical pediatric clinic, it's usually chaos. Yeah. And yeah. you come in here and it's kind of zen. Mm -hmm. You know, we worked really mm -hmm. closely with you mm -hmm. and the staff mm -hmm. to figure out how patients and staff should, in, and the doctor mm -hmm. should interface. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think we solved that to some degree. It's yeah. For, uh, I just, I mean, I've heard this, but I, you can confirm it that it's, it's a lot less stressful than it used to be to work. At, at your office yeah the spaces are opened up enough you know the height of the ceiling and then just all the light and glass really does make a difference and so I think the ceiling heights made a huge difference yeah. uh, and I, I really like the fact too that we were able to get some good natural light in the middle of the building mm -hmm. which is sometimes mm -hmm. difficult yeah but this is a place I believe where a lot of your mm -hmm. nurses uh, 
Yeah, so we work, will so. tend to do a lot of our, our work here and then the physician's offices mm -hmm. and... Uh, I really appreciate when you wanted this building, you were very clear about having uh, really dignified spaces for your staff, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. their own private entrance, mm -hmm. they didn't have to overlap. So it's a very controlled relationship between the staff and the patients, mm -hmm. which I think... And the the it has seemed like the layout has really helped with just the cooling. It doesn't seem uh -huh. like it's just, it doesn't get hot. Well, uh, and we have, you know, I believe we've looked at your energy bills and they're kind of way mm -hmm, down for a mm -hmm. building this size. Yeah. I think part of that is the whole south elevation mm -hmm. is more of a surface than a lot of windows. We get the light mm -hmm, from above and mm -hmm. the skylights. And then having places to be able to put all the art yes. has been really a... I do think too, having art, uh, on the outside of the building mm -hmm. in terms of the sculpture mm -hmm. and then having art mm -hmm. on the inside is also something that's enriching. Uh, like that's my mom. She, oh, is that she your mom? donated that to ah, the Oh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful painting. Mm -hmm. We were wondering who, but just this is this nice simple loop. Yeah, yeah is it? right. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. just very. And there's enough change even in the lighting that you feel yeah. like you've kind of, I don't know, been in more than one place. So yeah. it tends to kind of. I think make people feel at ease. Uh, the yeah. patients have certainly expressed that, that they yeah. feel comfortable and it's professional and it's clean. You know, this was a true collaboration. Mm -hmm. We learned a lot. Yeah. And, and you hopefully you all learned something. I enjoyed a lot, yeah. Uh, and yeah. neither of us mm -hmm. could have made this mm -hmm. without that collaborative yeah. participatory right. effort. So. Right, yeah. Win-win. It was, it yeah. was a lot. It was a very enjoyable experience. Yeah. So like I was saying, as you drive by or you, you walk by, the building changes from the red to the gray and has a whole different personality. So it's, in some ways, it's like a billboard, a beautiful abstract billboard uh, in this suburban context. Uh, and it, it really has to find itself as just another way to build uh, in these different contexts. Uh, but the idea is to use abstraction, the reduction of material and form and details to create another way of making architecture in the suburban context. So we've really had the privilege and opportunity to work on, a, I think, a really great project the last several years, two, three years, called the Faden School. And it's an applied learning school with three signature programs. And I love, I love seeing this right here, the great Elevation really explains what we're doing with the, with the roof pitching and rolling of the roof. Kind of gives a, a nice scale, different scale to the rooms on the inside, classrooms or the admin. Here's one of the first of our dog trots. Nice breezeway. Great place to be. I always try to connect you with the sky. That's a good thing. You know, if I'm on the ground, I love looking up at the sky too. I don't know. These dog trots are great because they generate breezes. They provide an like outdoor classroom. Uh, they uh, really act as thresholds that sort of move north-south or south-north out, out into this main campus. So it's pretty exciting. Hey, Clayton. Hey, Marlon. How you doing, man? Good. Good, Good to, to see, see you. you. How's everything going? Uh, going great. Right. Uh, at the hallway, the classrooms, because sure. it's, it's such a wonderful just, sequence. Yeah, we need to do that. I forgot about that. But I love the fact that we made the decision on the plywood, don't you? I do. This just straightforward, everyday material that works well with these uh, polished concrete floors. Well, and it's such, such long buildings, uh, inflected them and bent them so that it kind of break the scale down, get you some nice light in these corridors. Yeah. Well, I remember, you know, when we were thinking about how to translate program into space, one of the Sort of mantras was pathways and light. Pathways and light, that's right. Pathways uh, yeah. on the outside, pathways on the inside. inside. Running parallel, crisscrossing. Yeah. I love the clear story on this yeah. hallway. Yeah, I think that's the big surprise. You look out at these, these classroom buildings and they look horizontal and low, and then you come inside and they, they're vertical. Yeah. They're like, wow, yeah. kind of monumental. I think that had a lot to do with just being concerned about daylight yeah. in the middle of the building. So using that roof to kind of get popping it up. Yeah. Get some daylight in. All right. All right. Cheers. Yeah, okay. I love our classrooms because they're all they're all different in their own way. Lots of natural light. Yeah, I just love this relationship and 
all these labs have direct access to, to the outdoors here, with little places to sit, think, reflect. The thing I really enjoy though is just, just the natural light that you get, not only from one side, but we've opened up above the doors and you connect to the, the transom. It's kind of a, a, it's an interesting idea where, you know, you take, uh, real quickly, just take the roof here, and you're really kind of just sort of doing that. And then, you know, here's your glass here and the wall, and there's your glass there. And so people are walking in here and you get light that comes, you borrow that light here. And then of course it also comes into here. Just the whole thing comes alive uh, with light. That's gotta make the sun happy. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, there's nothing more fun than a construction site. That's, so we're building a campus from the, from the ground up. This used to be the old uh, county fairgrounds. So this building here, what we call reels, is complete and occupied, and we have the home building over there. And then across the way here is what we call the wheels building. And they're, it's, a, it's, get, it's about, a, I'd say, about a month and a half away from being finished. We really thought a lot about how we the color of this facade. This is a custom color. It's a green gold metallic flake that we match to a 67 green gold Mustang as well as to these grasses. So we, we knew what grasses Andrew Pogon was going to plant and it's really fantastic. I mean you, you start to kind of pick some of these different types of plant material and we spent tons of time just kind of looking at how those would work together uh, with the building. So there's a kind of relationship between what is nature made on the campus and what is uh, more culture made or, or man made. Ah, another porch as we enter here into the wheels. So as you can see, construction's going on. One of our favorite materials here with the plywood. These are all different types of collaborative, uh, collaborative spaces, classrooms, again, all centered around uh, making. I like these carpet tiles, those are nice. How y'all doing? Hey, Ian. How you doing? Hey, Rob. How's there? So back outdoors into a, another one of our dog trots or porch spaces. Again, this idea of being indoors and outdoors and working and really every space is that becomes an educational space. Yeah. They hear students learn how to work on bike. And then certain times of the week or the weekend, these big glass doors, they roll up. So then we come out here on Main Street and uh, the owners, they really wanted an interface with Main Street. There's not a lot happening in this part. So we had, came up with an idea of a, a, a a big giant porch so rather than carving it away from the building we added a porch to the building uh, and this is where you, like I say you can imagine the students uh, out here working on bikes fixing bikes for the local uh, folks yeah yeah this is going to be a really really nice a nice piece here that really helps introduce you to the campus and you know just a a nice urban space Anybody can use it. That's the beauty of it. It's, it's public. And I think that's what makes this school different. It's an open campus and it's public in a lot of ways. There you can see it. I wonder where this idea came from. And we're always thinking about barns in some way or form and just kind of learning from the language of barns learning from the language of the vernacular. And it really gives us an opportunity to use abstraction as a way to make a connection to our place, but also we hope to a larger, more universal discussion uh, about the role of architecture in today's society. Hey, so we're here at the Thaden Barn as part of the, the main campus of Thaden school. 
Uh, it's a barn that's really rooted in the vernacular barns of our place here. Uh, and through abstraction, uh, we've developed it uh, into a barn that's really for the 21st century. And it just illustrates you, you that any project can become architecture and deserves to be architecture. And further, it demonstrates that architecture can happen anywhere, at any scale, at any budget, and for anyone. What does teaching bring to your practice? I think it brings uh, a certain kind of agency about problem solving. Mm. You know, that uh, I can walk in and if I'm working on a project, I know there is more than one way to solve this problem. Mm. And I learned that through teaching. You know, you're in a studio with 15 different students working on the same oh, project. Yes. and they come up with all these different possibilities and solutions. Yeah. That's very invigorating. That's, that is a process of iteration that you see played out in the studio that you can bring with you into the office. And that energizes uh, the staff, that energizes the way our clients, the way we approach projects. Mm. So there is, is a, a really great exchange. Conversely, what does the, the practice orientation that you have bring to yeah. the teaching? Yeah. Well. Practice gives me depth in the teaching. I can, I can go deep. I can talk with credibility <laughs> about details and about uh, you know construction and 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 the manifestation of an idea into something physical and tangible, uh, and and something that can be understood, but also felt. And so practice, I think, really really allows that to happen at a much deeper and richer level. Uh, when I teach, and I, I see the students perk up, you know, and you know, you, you know, sometimes you use a few anecdotes or whatever, but that's good because that's setting them up for not just their time here at Faye Jones School of Architecture, but also in anticipation of the profession that lies ahead for them.